My name is Iris Steen and I am Head of Communications here at the Social Care Institute for Excellence, or SKY. And SKY and our partners PPL are hosting this series of webinars on behalf of the Better Care Support Team at NHS England. Before I get our presenters to introduce themselves, there's a couple of technical things for you to know. First of all, we're recording this webinar. That means that any messages that you type into the chat box will appear in that recording. And we'll make that recording available on this guy's website next week. During the presentation, you can type comments or questions in the chat box, which you should see at the um, bottom right of your screen. And you just need to hit return in order to send it. That will go to everybody, to the presenters and to the participants. And you're very welcome to obviously chat amongst yourselves while we're also presenting. We'll answer your questions at the end of the presentations, but do feel free to send them through as we go along. I've also already posted a web link that will take you to a copy of this presentation plus some handouts that are related to it. And again, they'll get referred to during the presentation, but it's probably easier for you to have a look at that later. So now I'm going to hand across to our presenters um, who will introduce themselves. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name's Hannah Miller. I'm a senior associate here at the uh, Care Institute for Excellence. But until two years ago, I was the director of adult services in um, Croydon. Um, and since retirement, have actually had assignments with the Department of Health on the National Helping People Home Team. And over the last couple of uh, three winters, indeed, have actually done work with the Better Care support team at the um, NHSE. And now, Wendy, you would like to introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Wendy Lippman. I work for Nottinghamshire County Council Adult Social Care and Health Department as a Transformation Manager. Um, and there's three of those posts. I cover the mid knots patch, and our responsibilities are about working out how social care can best align and integrate with health and other partners. Um, I also have some county-wide responsibilities and one of those is facilitating our approach towards delayed transfers of care across the whole adult social care and health department. Okay, I think we'll kick off the uh, presentation then. My, one of my colleagues is uh, changing the slides for me, so hopefully we can keep uh, in, in tandem. Um, just to say, we have got a number of um, slides and handouts on the Sky website, as Iris said, so just we'll, we'll move on. Um, I've given you also a very short summary, high-level summary, of some of the things I'll be covering in the presentation, but again, for you to have a look at later. Um, transfers of care, I've headed this one a real challenge. This really is the, um, I suppose, the perfect storm that many of you are finding yourselves in at the moment. Um, I, in your handout, I've given you a whole kind of series of, of um, factual bites, sound bites. But I think the fact that there's been um, over a million bed days lost um, in 2015, huge increase in both NHS and social care delays, uh, something like uh, the N uh, National Audit Office estimating that 820 million costs to the NHS in, in delays. Um, quite sad that despite all the brilliant targets that were set around the Better Care Fund, that actually, uh, and everybody's hard work, that it didn't deliver. Um, and that actual increases in days lost have gone up and indeed has cost another £146 million pounds more, than, more than planned. There is the pressure on NHS providers, uh, particularly the acute, um, acute providers, and indeed local authority expenditure has fallen. Um, some of the other factors are the fact that so many home care providers have actually handed back their contracts to local authorities because they're no longer financially viable that there are something like 5,000 uh, residential care beds lost in the last uh, 18 months. And of course, you're all dealing with uh, demographics and increased acuity and co comorbidity. But it's not only about the money. And I think this was a title of um, an article by the, by the King's Fund. Uh, something, uh, it, this has all become incredibly political. 
And I think there was a big discussion in the in the House of Commons recently where the Prime Minister talked about 50% of delayed transfers actually happening in 24 um, partnership areas of the country. So it's not just funding, there has to be some practice issues involved. Um, wide variation in social care delays uh, ranging from um, uh, naught to 25 days per thousand population over 65. No clear relationship between the reduction in local authority funding levels and the numbers of delays. And the variation in NHS delays is even wider between two and 33 days per thousand population over 65. But what is interesting, and I suppose you would say um, to be expected, is that the long delays for health and social care both tend to correspond in the same areas. So who should be sharing responsibility? Well, obviously, the usual suspects, the variety of NHS partners, and indeed um, the councils, the social care element of the councils. Um, but very importantly, um, there's a whole list on the right-hand side of this slide, uh, which can't be uh, forgotten. Um, housing, I think, is becoming more and more central. Um, the whole role of adaptations, the need to prevent falls, um, the whole role of sheltered extra care housing, I think, is becoming more and more important. And certainly, my belief is that every single assessment around discharge needs to look very carefully at housing, whether people are in their own accommodation or whether they're, they're in um, some, some form of supported accommodation. Um, I think increasingly over the last couple of years, the, both the voluntary sector and the private sector are being included more around the table in conversations about delayed discharges. Um, but I still feel there is more that could be done here. I think given the importance of both domiciliary care and residential care, and indeed the, the role of the voluntary sector in helping uh, facilitate discharge, particularly for people who are socially isolated, that is absolutely essential. Families and informal carers go without, without saying, but I think a real importance of getting some of the engagement messages out to the wider community. We're talking a lot these days about asset-based approaches in social care, and I think it's not enough to be having those engagement conversations with um, patients and with uh, their immediate families. I think some of those wider messages to go out. And right in the centre, um, our large character there is, I think, is to emphasise the whole importance of those self-care and promoting independence messages and the kind of responsibility that people take themselves about maintaining their health and hopefully keeping themselves um, away from uh, more, uh, more dependency. So what gets in the way of taking uh, shared responsibility for transfers of care? I go into this in quite a lot more detail in the handout that, I've, that I'm providing, but I think I've divided them into resource system, cultural and, and operational. I can't go through them all in the time that we've got got available, but certainly just to pick up on a few, and some of the systems issues which are coming out really clearly is where there is weak leadership in a system across the different agencies with perhaps a lack of vision, a lack of ambition, perhaps in slow to embrace new ways of working, uh, some of the silo working and blame culture that can happen. Um, also, I think a fear of loss of relationships where people have perhaps had tough times in the past and have really started to work better together problems happen around delays and then some of the old the old um, practices um, either creep back or people are really worried about losing some of their good relationships. Um, one of the things that came up very strongly in the workshops that we've been running is the disconnect that can happen between strategic and operational managers where different people attend where different people attend different um, meetings to talk about some of these issues and sometimes there isn't a connection and therefore there's absolutely crucial that if there is a conversation in the A&E delivery board or in any of those strategic groups that those messages are very clearly conveyed out to operational managers who obviously have the relationships with the front line and it's at the front line where so much of this actually happens. Um, cultural issues, again, the, the um, whole different histories and languages across health and social care. Um, I think there is the fear of organisational change and also that organisational change does have personal consequences and people can be very worried about those. But I think also um, some different approaches to discharge planning. 
Um, and I think, obviously, where solutions are promised prior to a full assessment taking place, then false expectations can get set up and that then causes issues and people perhaps um, wanting one solution rather than a home, a home first solution. The kind of operational issues that um, I, I, again, discussed in a lot of detail in the workshops is some of the disagreement over criteria used for discharge notices. And Wendy, I think, will, will say more on that uh, when, she, when she comes in later. Um, but also the uh, reticence on personal information sharing. And I think that's something that the National Audit Office have picked up on very strongly. Um, and also um, the poor data that can sometimes be available on comparable costs and outcomes across the different care settings. Uh, resource issues you're struggling with all the time. Um, I've talked about financial challenge across all agencies, but particularly some of the issues around the markets, um, you know, with a lack of good quality care home places in, in, in many parts of the country, and also a very variable approach to um, domiciliary care. One of the areas I did really want to pick up on is workforce challenges, and I think that, um, you know, that recruitment and retention uh, varies across the country, and that can be nurses, doctors, social workers, care home staff, domiciliary workers. But it's not just in rural areas. Those, some of those issues are really now hitting in to um, more urban areas. And I think, again, a, a big challenge for the um, STPs will be the lack of historical investment in out-of-hospital settings, um, given the pressures on acute providers without that investment in uh, out-of-hospital care. Um, some of these transformational changes are not going to happen. So I suppose the, the, the central um, thesis is that a whole system approach is essential for, for safe and timely um, transfers. The Better Care Fund guidance um, for 16-17 did bring in a national condition uh, requiring local areas to develop a clear focused action plan for managing delays and also for the first time about actually ring fencing money uh, for the commissioning of out-of-hospital services. The new guidance, as you, you now know, um, actually contains a national condition and metric on, on delayed transfers of care with a link into the, the use of the new, the new social care monies. Um, and also, I think um, one, of the, one of the, I suppose it's not really a joke, but one of the things I've been saying, that in some ways um, it would have appeared that the role of the A&E delivery boards had almost um, commandeered the approach to delayed transfers in terms of the very uh, clear mandate they've had. Um, but um, it's almost as though the Better Care Fund is now actually regaining uh, the ground on that with this, with this, new, national, um, this new national condition. Um, I don't need to tell you how complex this all is and that there are no easy fixes, but I think that um, one of the things I have pointed out here is that um, the provision of timely safe discharges are a really good illustration of the benefits of delivering integrated care. And certainly the literature that's available is very clear about a strong correlation of good performance on transfers with where systems are on the integration um, journey. What I was really surprised about in the workshops that we've just been running across the country was how few people that attended those workshops were aware of stepping up to the place, which is the integration self-assessment tool, and indeed how, uh, how few of them had actually used it. And, it. and certainly, I think, pending some of the work that is um, going to be coming forward on integration standards from the Department of Health, I think that really is a, a good first step for local systems to be using and um, stepping up to place. Um, the guidance uh, and framework for the Better Care Fund uh, on the same day that that was issued, Sky actually published uh, their scoping research on Integration 2020, which I really would encourage you to take a look at. And that includes some draft standards that the Department of Health are thinking of issuing in terms of developing a balanced scorecard to assess how local health and social care economies are doing around the integration agenda. And there is actually a lot of consultation going on in a number of places up and down the country. So again, if you have the opportunity to take part in any of those consultation events, I would uh, recommend that to you. 
So, uh, what are the, some of the things that are important to um, consider? Again, I've given you quite a lot of information in, in the handout that, that, that is attached uh, on, the, uh, on the website. But um, some of the questions I think that people need to be asking themselves um, around leadership and governance, is there a strong message from system leadership on the priority of safe transfers and an acceptance of collective responsibility? Is there strong integrated program planning, program interdependencies and monitoring of progress across the system? Um, do organisations actually hold each other to account for the effectiveness of their role in, in transfers? Um, how the Better Care Fund um, um, governance structures are working with the A&E delivery boards. Uh, are, they, uh, are the delivery boards streaming flow and discharge planning reflecting the joint responsibility of the system to operate uh, um, optimally? That's around triage, around the safer bundle, our models of trusted assessor, discharge to assess being introduced. And is it all joined up with the Better Care Fund? Um, Around commissioning, how integrated is your commissioning? Do you have a joint co-production approach to market management and the development, um, including a joint market position uh, statement? Um, what was interesting is the CARE Act gave local authorities responsibility for the market development statement, but actually it should be a joint responsibility, and I, that's something I think that uh, systems need to be to be looking at. Um, I've, I'm not going to go through the whole host of things that you need to be perhaps. Uh, checking against how you're emphasising prevention of um, admissions, uh, but obviously multidisciplinary teams, rapid response, self-care strategy, support to care homes, um, op you know, population and outcome, uh, micro outcome-based commissioning are all areas that you perhaps need to be to be looking at. And what's interesting is that is that those um, uh, economies who are further ahead on the integration agenda, some of the vanguards, people moving towards accountable care organisations or approved provider alliances, um, again, are, are doing very well in some of those areas. Right. Um, again, Wendy's going to talk a bit about later about um, the analysis of the DTOP da data. Is it clear? Is it jointly owned? Um, do you have a clear understanding of where delays fit into the wider system of care, including avoiding admissions in the first place? And um, what I think I've certainly found in, in um, working with different economies over the last couple of years is there's a real mixed picture as to whether systems really do understand if some of their better care fund schemes are effective and if they are actually um, providing um, value for money and targeted to the highest impact areas. Um, Again, I have given you a whole list of uh, best practice, um, which again, economies that are further ahead on the integration agenda will, will have, and I'm not going to repeat them all here, but, but certainly integrated reablement, the kind of support being put into care homes, um, how you're using the voluntary sector, whether you've got the right kind of protocols with, with housing to, to uh, help speed up discharge. Um, the, the speedy ordering and delivery of equipment, a whole host of things that I've actually included in, in the handout. And how do you optimise what is seen to work well? Are pilots scaled up in a timely fashion? Um, you could spend too much time over-evaluating and lose, the, uh, lo lose track of the, the, the outcome. Um, and also, um, there are examples where economies have brought in things that have worked elsewhere, not tuned them into their local area and in fact wonder then why the whole thing hasn't actually um, worked. Um, and just ending in terms of, of the things you need to, to, to consider is the whole issue of work, whole system workforce planning and development. Um, certainly two years ago the uh, National Helping People Home Team found very, very few examples of where systems were actually looking at workforce in a collective way and where you had um, health and so, so health and the private sector in particular perhaps competing for the recruitment of nurses across care homes, community trusts, acute, acute trusts and again it's about getting some of that actually looked at as a whole, a whole system. I really like this, um, it's, this is not a model but it's, um, it, it, it's based on um, some work that was issued uh, through the Better Care Fund support team last year on um, signposting uh, resources to actually look at how people are operating delayed transfers across the system or improving transfers across the system. 
And I like it because you've got the service user and the family and community right at the center, but round the outside, you've actually got this outer circle, which is the integrated system across primary community and social care, and very importantly, including the point I made about self-care and self-management in helping avoid hospital admissions. Um, the, if you go, if you actually, I've given you the details of this in the resource uh, list at the end, and you can actually, if you go into that resource card, you just have to click on um, the headings, and that gives you a number of whole good practice examples that are going on across across the country. And I, I really do like this, and you can look at this um, in tandem with the. Um, impact the high impact change model which has just been revised by the um, by the NHSC and which again I've given you the uh, resource um, um, signposting at the end I'm not going to go through all these indicators but uh, again if you look at the quick guide the NHSC quick guide to discharge to assess there is a whole really helpful list of process and outcome measures embedded in there and um, a number of these will be routinely collected, and it's a bit how they're how they're analysed. But rest, some of them will be um, bespoke collections of, of of information. The one I really wanted to pick up on was the one at the end, which is about recording patient experience. And again, I found um, very few economies are routinely actually asking people what their experience is of of trans of transfers of care. And I think without that information about how it's actually affecting the individual it is very it's quite difficult to actually fine-tune what you're actually doing around um, helping to um, share that responsibility for transfers and to, to optimize it um, this sounds a bit like motherhood and apple pie but um, I've tried a few times to actually describe what the, what the outcome should, should be um, and therefore trying to bring in something which actually looks about preventing unnecessary admissions and readmissions but is about timely safe discharge ideally to the person's own, own home and I'll say a little bit more about some of the examples of that as, as we go, go along. Okay, we're going to go on to some of the further examples um, and initiatives that are going on. And they, by absolutely no means are these, are these exclusive. Uh, and some of the ones I've picked are ones that there is quite a lot of um, literature uh, written, written about. Um, but starting with the, um, the Hertfordshire vanguard, um, which is covering East Hertfordshire. And that's one of the six vanguards that really honed in on providing better care for care home um, residents. And certainly what they've done there is coordinate the care, look to coordinate the care of the individual using a care outcomes framework. Um, that they've actually put a lot of effort, energy and effort into upskilling the care home staff to put enhanced GP input into care homes. They've got a home first multidisciplinary team, community geriatric team, crisis response, enhanced end of life care, really good practice. And what it's resulted in is that they have actually had a much more integrated approach with care homes, resulting in reduced hospital admissions, uh, easier transfers, fewer ambulance call-outs, reduced falls, reduced reliance on crisis teams, improved advanced care planning, and has led to more confident care home staff teams. So a really good example, and there's got quite a lot of um, literature around, around the Hertfordshire Vanguard. Um, my next slide is on the mid knots vanguard and um, I just I, I'm going to in, in a moment introduce when Wendy Lipman from mid knots who's going to um, talk through some of these things with us but I think it's worth saying that um, about 15 months or so ago um, there was a real major delay transfers of care and length of stay issue in mid knots um, and it was actually uh, identified as a whole system wicked issue and there was a piece of work done with which Sky hope, helped to facilitate with a whole systems workshop actually looking at what was wrong with the system and how things could be improved. And that has resulted, I think, in, in certainly an improvement of performance around social care delayed, um, uh, delayed transfers and indeed length of improvements in length of stay of patients uh, who 
were in hospital for more than 14 days. But if I could please introduce now Wendy Lippman, who is the Transformation Manager from uh, Mid Notts, um, from uh, Nottinghamshire County Council. So Wendy, I hope you're on the end of the, uh, the line there somewhere. Yes, hi. Thanks, Hannah. Um, hello, everybody. I've had my uh, microphone turned on, so hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Um, I'll try and keep it to five minutes. There's obviously a lot that I could talk about, so if you want to pick up anything later in questions, that would be great. I'm, as Hannah mentioned, I work for Adult Social Care and Health. It's not a joint appointment, but I represent uh, social care in the work that we've been doing within the Better Together Midnots PACS Alliance. So there's actually 12 different partner agencies on the Alliance, including the Acute Trust, the Community Trust, Ambulance Service, um, GP, On Call, uh, two voluntary sector organisations, a home, home care core provider as well. Um, so we're all working together to try and resolve uh, the key issues across the mid knots area, of which delayed transfers of care is obviously uh, a key one. And the workshop that Hannah facilitated last June was a, a really brilliant event that helped every uh, nearly 100 people to come together from across all those different partners to, uh, to really share some messages and thoughts about what wasn't working as well as it could do and what we needed to do going forward. And that's, that's given us the permission, if you like, to meet together regularly to, to focus on um, what we've called an integrated discharge review. So all the things that you can see on the slide are being addressed at the moment by this multi-agency working group. We started off between July and November focusing our efforts on trying to design an integrated uh, discharge team and thinking about the pathways in how a future model would work perfectly. Um, but actually we could only take that to a certain point. We couldn't, we didn't have enough understanding of the current position and the gaps to understand how we would resource this new perfect model and what, what the benefits would, act, the scale of the benefits would actually be. So we, we've put the future model to the side at the moment and we're now addressing key operational work streams to resolve the issues that we've got at the moment and then I think we're going to be developing a business case to say we've done what we can operationally this is the kind of investor save case that we need to implement this um, step change really to get to the, the more integrated model. So we've got a program plan at the moment that covers implementing a lot of the best practice guidance that you'll probably have seen on the ESIP uh, and Department of Health websites. So for example about implementing red to green days within the hospital to try and reduce the number of internal delays, I hope that means something to people, implementing board rounds, daily meetings to discuss people, patients on wards. Um, there's a length of stay programme, we're refining how we code detox and how we discuss people delayed every week. We've, we've got a working group around uh, discharge pathways because there wasn't any clear diagram to show what are the discharge pathways available in mid knots so that it was clear for staff and service use carers which pathway was most appropriate for somebody. I'm leading a work stream around patient choice and that's again implementing the best practice um, material that's available uh, nationally. A lot of that is about making sure there's consistent information given to people when they first are admitted to hospital so they've got clear expectations about their journey through the hospital in and out again and that staff are clear about the messages that they're giving and, um, and how that all works. We're also working on the assessment side of things. We're, from looking at the detox information, uh, we're very clear that our top three reasons for delays, and Hannah helped us to think about this, the top three reasons for delays are problems with assessments, and a lot of that is to do with um, continuing health care, uh, delays to do with finding home care packages, and thirdly, delays that are categorised as patient choice, either because um, patients are rejecting interim offers of care or are taking a long time to actually identify the most uh, the right discharge option for the, 
for the patient. So all of that is, is going on at the moment. And how social care is involved uh, has changed quite significantly over the last six months. We've now joined these daily board rounds. We're monitoring the uh, use of assessment notices and discharge notices to the social care team. And we're talking with our health colleagues about why a lot of them are inappropriate, which is obviously a waste of time for people, how we can Im improve the use of assessment notices and discharge notices. Um, we're also looking into uh, ICT systems that can give us a sense of what the real-time vacancies are across our care home market because, as I'm sure might be the case for you as well, our social care staff are ringing around for vacancies, health staff on wards are ringing around for vacancies to support families, um, families themselves are ringing around to find out where the vacancies are, all probably calling the same homes. Um, so that's a, that's a real problem at the moment. Uh, we're also looking into how we can fund a trusted assessor role for care homes because we do have delays where the care homes are not able to um, send staff in that day to do an assessment for somebody waiting. I'm hoping that will be funded. Well, we've got some money aside from the BCF to do that. Uh, we're also liaising with our home care partners to try and work out how we can bring them into the discharge discussions earlier and give them more advance notice of people who will be needing home care packages. So that's the kind of alliance work that's ongoing at the moment to, to reduce our uh, delays. In terms of this, just quickly, in terms of the social care side of things, we, we were actually 50, uh, 55th in the country in March 16 in terms of the number of social care delays, and we've got that down to being uh, ninth in the country by December uh, last year. And a lot of that has been about focusing on how those delays are counted within each trust and making sure that we are able to validate the data before it's sent in by the trust to NHS England. And that is um, something that I would definitely recommend to any authority if you want. Obviously, we want to make sure that the data is accurate so that we know what the real reasons for our delays are and that we can come up with solutions to those. So our county-wide working group within the council has been really helpful to ensure that our hospital discharge teams are all aware of the SITREPS guidance and are implementing it consistently. Uh, I have to say we have also got weekend staff available at the front door of hospitals and at the back door, so there's no gap in assessment over the weekend. The CCGs are funding that. Uh, and we've also got a bridging service for home care so that if our home care providers aren't able to pick somebody up for a few days or a week, that this standby bridging service can, can fill that gap and enable somebody to be discharged. So those, those are a range. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And when, when we get to question time, uh, we, we can actually pick up on those issues. Right. Okay, we're going to move on with uh, with the presentation. Um, I thought it would be quite interesting to put uh, as one of the um, examples of, of good or promising practice what's actually going on in uh, Croydon Health Services uh, and Croydon Council, which is a total redesign of how emergency care to over 65s is being delivered, and that includes acute assessment, ambulatory care comprehensive geriatric care and a rapid response uh, with one multidisciplinary unit and direct access. Uh, senior consultant review in two hours, treatment. Sorry, uh, we've lost that. No, can we go back to that slide? To uh, Edgecombe. Back. 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 There. No, forward one. Thank you. <laughs> I think, yeah, okay. So um, I think what's really interesting here is that what, what has happened is that it, uh, something like 25 to 30 people avoid admission um, every day. They don't go in via A&E and they actually go straight directly in via their GP to the, um, the multidisciplinary unit. Uh, there are three dedicated social workers who um, in, ensure that uh, any appropriate care package is actually set up. 
And I think what's um, really important is how the voluntary sector plays in with Age UK Croydon following up on any lonely, isolated people aged over, over 55, because obviously isolation, uh, people go home, even though they may not be triggering um, Care Act criteria, um, that they actually uh, do need that kind of support um, on, on discharge. I'm going to say a little bit about discharge um, or transfer to assess um, because I think this, you know, this is something that um, economies are being mandated to introduce and I know a lot of you have got these um, um, services running already. Um, big mix, real mixed picture across the country um, as to what's being described as discharge to assess, whether it's home first, step down, reablement. And I suppose what I'd, the um, message I'd be wanting to give people is from what I've actually seen up and down the country, that they're not a panacea by themselves. That that model I showed you of the um, integrated system for having a maximum effect on delayed transfers, you need a lot of that actually coming into play. You know, just by bringing in discharge to assess, it's not going to actually fix the issue for you. Um, there's also too much emphasis on bed-based schemes, and I'm, you know, and I know I've argued uh, quite a bit with people at the various workshops. Um, my view is that, that some of the schemes are too risk-averse in scaling up and targeting higher levels of um, of dependency. And I know that um, one um, director of adult services in the London borough just said to me in the last week or two that if there were resources available for night care and night care sitting. Um, in her area that she could actually be um, facilitating transfers of much, much higher, people with much, much higher levels of dependency. There's also evaluation of many of these schemes um, because of poor data quality, uh, the need for better information sharing. And I think one of the things I always do flag up is that some of the schemes are providing uh, savings to acute trusts, but with a risk of cost transfer to social care. And the answer to that is obviously having risk share agreements and moving towards uh, pooling budgets. I'll just give you a few examples of discharge to assess before I, before I finish off. But um, I think if we move on to, um, to Medway, I mean, there's a lot written about Medway. What I liked about Medway was they introduced their discharge to assess um, scheme very quickly. I think it took something like three months to get it set up, and it was very much in response to problems with performance around transfers. Uh, there was some joint funding put in by both the CCG and the local authority. Uh, they didn't introduce new teams, but they realigned the functions of existing teams to provide a, a single point of access for coordination of discharge. I think the important uh, thing about the Medway scheme is the home first branding. There were posters and, and messages um, put out to the public and to, to uh, patients coming into the hospital, and it was very much a hearts and minds communication. Um, and very positive experience reported by both patients and staff, and very important from your point of view, uh, resulting in a significant reduction in delayed transfers. Um, another um, scheme which uh, there has uh, certainly ha is written up and you'll find on the um, on the uh, signposting resource is um, what's going on in Doncaster, uh, which is they've actually redesigned their discharge pathways and introduced a multi-agency rapid assessment team in a, the emergency department and the medical acute unit. Um, what I found particularly interesting was the fact that they've actually got a computerised eye tracker which is visible to GPs, because I think one of the issues I hear from GPs is that, that somebody goes into hospital, uh, they lose track of them, and then the next thing is they're being discharged, and you know sometimes there's a delay in hearing about that. So joint health and social care simple assessments are done within two hours of the of discharge home. Uh, support goes in the same day. More complex cases are dealt with by a joint integrated discharge team, and again the reduction in direct admissions uh, from care home uh, to, from, to care homes from hospital has been one of the results there. Again, this is just one of many, many schemes. <clears throat> I could have picked out probably another, another dozen to talk about. Um, South Warwickshire, um, in, your, in your handouts, there is actually a real detailed analysis of some of the cost benefits around 
uh, for health and social care that have been introduced in, in um, South Warwickshire. And if for many people across the country, South Warwickshire would be where probably one of the first places that were really clear about pathway design, uh, you know, setting up their pathway one, their pathway two, their path, pathway three, uh, putting dedicated GP input into their pathways two and three, and actually trusted assessment between health and social care, both both in-house reenablement and rehabilitation, and having care coordinators support patients and families throughout throughout discharge. Um, I had um, a senior manager from um, South Warwickshire CCG talk at talk with me at one of the workshops, and what she said was, despite all the good things they've got. Uh, in Trey in South Warwickshire, they still do have an issue with delayed transfers of care. But she made the point very strongly that it would be an awful lot worse without all the things that they've actually put in put in uh, in play. Um, moving on to useful tools and resources, I'm not going to go through these, but um, you can see that I've given you a whole number of links here. Uh, to things um, that I think would be helpful. Uh, many of you will know these already, uh, but I think it's sometimes quite quite useful to be reminded of them. And again, I was quite surprised, uh, given the number of people who attended the national uh, masterclasses and workshops, um, how few people had actually accessed some of these resources. And I think anybody that's working in this field, whether whether you're actually directly operationally involved or strategically involved, or you're actually project managing and whatever, I think it's really important that you do get to grips with what's what's happening around good practice and indeed promising practice. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to go back to to Iris now. Okay, well, thank you very much to everybody who's hung in there, um, and great to see that you're sharing information through the the chat box there. That's great. Uh, and equally, if anybody's offering information to share, we're very happy to collate that uh, and, and share it either um, via the Sky website and also um, by the Better Care support team. The main aim of this is really to help people share information about what's going on. We now want to take any questions. So again, if you've got any questions or comments that you'd like to add um, to the chat room, um, Wendy and Hannah are still with us and, and able to answer those. Uh, so please do ask any questions. Um, and I, you know, I noticed in particular, Andrew, you're talking about um, that Liverpool has a bed brokerage service and a dom care brokerage uh, package in place to keep information in one place. I don't know if um, uh, Wendy or, or Hannah have any comments on that kind of uh, service. And equally, Karen in Hampshire, you're talking about the use of a competent data. As, a, as a, another tool that you're using. Again, I'll throw the pause to Hannah um, and also to Wendy. If you've got any comments on that or any other issues coming through while you're typing in some questions. It's absolutely um, essential that you do have um, you know, a brokerage in, in place. So I think otherwise you have individual social workers chasing chasing everything round. Um, and I think there are some really excellent examples of, uh, of brokerage across the country. I don't know whether Wendy would like to um, comment on um, what the brokerage situation is in uh, mid knots. Uh, when, I was, when I was explaining about all the different phone calls to the different care homes, we don't have a single central um, function to do that. What social care have um, care package organisers, so our social workers will uh, commission a package and then send it through to a team who then contact the care, home care providers. But obviously that isn't available for somebody uh, who's a self-funder if they're going to be sorting it all out themselves and they don't want our involvement, they're then ringing around the home care providers uh, themselves. And the, um, it, it's different again for when people have it fully funded, um, and, and the same for care homes. Uh, so I have heard about a care, a brokerage service in Hertfordshire, and I'm interested to find out more about what happens in Liverpool. As I, as I mentioned, we have had a presentation from a company who've been working with Hertfordshire called OLM, who have developed a interactive website type function with 
and they incentivize care homes to have a profile on this uh, system so that it's very clear where there are vacancies and whether they're short-term or long-term vacancies. So in theory, and as happens in Hertfordshire, people are able to log on to this website and get a, re a real-time um, situation. Okay, there's, there's a question from, from Jill about um, additional funding to address uh, um, GP primary care requirements into, uh, into care homes. Um, I mean, obviously, the example I, I gave you were both uh, were vanguards, and obviously the vanguards have had, have some, had some additional, additional funding. funding. But I think, but I that think even that if we're talking, if we're talking about working about around the STPs and how the whole systems are going to be transformed, I think one of the ways that you're going to actually release capacity within within the hospitals is by actually stopping this revolving door with, um, with care homes. And I know from... Um, when I was an acting um, director, one of the one of my main concerns was the very high levels of um, admissions into um, via A and E into into hospitals, um, and then obviously some of the issues around the difficulties of discharging people, or care homes sometimes feeling that people were then too dependent to come back to them. So again, I think absolutely essential when you're actually looking at how you transform the systems. Uh, particularly around the STP work that's going on, but the additional funding into um, into uh, uh, care homes is, and again, there's such a lot of learning from the six vanguards, and a lot of that is actually um, the Sutton Sutton Care Homes uh, Vanguard is published now by Sky. You'll find that on the Sky Workshop, and I think the Sky website again it would be worth looking at. Again, I don't know whether Wendy you'd like to uh, comment. Well, I think that was very comprehensive. Right, okay. Oh yeah, there was a um, question from Sue about uh, overcoming the trusted assessor in terms of, um, of care home placements. And I think this really is, you know, given that there is a, re a mandated requirement now to look at how you move towards trusted, trusted um, assessor models. I think this is a, this is a, a real, a real issue, and I think that um, I think it's easier probably to get it correct and, and sorted out between health and social care um, if there is a degree of trust and people are actually working within integrated uh, discharge teams. I think it begin, be, be, begins to be more difficult in actually persuading uh, care home providers, both residential and nursing uh, care home providers, to actually uh, accept the health and social care uh, trusted assessors, um, rather than wanting to go out and do their own assessment. And that's certainly yes. been, again, over the last couple of years. We have in lots of parts of the country where there is a delay, care homes not coming out over the weekend to uh, help facilitate discharges of their residents um, or indeed new, new admissions and um, often not coming out in you know later on in the evening it being quite a limited service and I think it's really important that um, authorities particularly where you're setting up uh, contracts with providers that that's something you do actually cover off in your contract it's obviously much more difficult with um, with uh, self self-funded again Wendy you may want to comment yes. on uh, what happens in mid -Nots. Well, we've actually um, we're, we've we've been over to visit Lincolnshire, where I don't know if people know the the Lincolnshire Care Home Association have received funding from their local CCG, and they employ a uh, resident uh, registered nurse who has who's based in each acute. Uh, setting. So I think they've got three acutes across Lincolnshire. They've trialled it in the first acute and it was so successful they've now rolled it out and that registered nurse has uh, gets to know all the local care homes um, and isn't actually seen as being from health or social care because they're employed by the Care Home Association. So the care homes trust this nurse to carry out assessments of people in hospital but she also smooths the path of people either going back to the care home that they came from or into a new placement making sure that all the meds etc is in place for when the person's discharged and that all the information is together um, so we 
We haven't solved that yet in Nottinghamshire, but we're in active discussion with representatives from care homes and the Care Home Association to see um, how we can pilot this kind of role in one of our patches, maybe south or, or mid knots, to, to see how it goes. Unfortunately, we don't. We only have about 50% of our care homes are members of the care home associations, and it's much higher in Lincolnshire. Um, but nevertheless, we're having wide discussions at the moment to try and get care homes to sign up to that kind of model and see what they think about it. Because they do have a legal duty to ensure that not only the person is going to be safe in their home, but that the other residents are going to be safe as well. So it is quite a big jump for them to trust somebody else to do that. Some of the issues that the care homes mentioned was they uh, they reluctant to come to Queen's Medical Centre because parking is so difficult. So there are some other things that could be addressed. And how this might affect um, better transfers of care and who might fund it. Um, I, this is something I'm really passionate about, the use of assistive technology. There, there, are, there appear to be not that many residential and nursing uh, care homes across the country that really have gone in for assistive technology in, in, in a big way. And that could be about, you know, sort of uh, pressure rugs that prevent falls. You know, it could be um, the kind of tele telehealth, telecare type type monitoring that people can access, can access. In, in their own homes. Um, and to my mind, it is something that both our health and social care, which we be looking seriously at, and something that um, I think could fit very much within the uh, Better Care Fund um, in terms of, of joint financing of, of some of these things. I think there are, there are um, um, certainly um, places in the country which I'm sure we could probably um, get, get identified that have actually done some of this, but it's certainly not, not widespread. Um, so I really think, I don't think it's, uh, there, there isn't a a miracle pool of money to pull down, but certainly I would have thought if the Better Care Fund is going to be about preventing admissions and actually um, uh, preventing admissions into hospital and actually getting people home safely, assistive technology in residential and care homes is, uh, is something really important. And obviously, um, you know, I think in terms of people's own home, I think the use of telecare is probably already um, well, well documented. Um, there's a point on single point of um, access. Um, is that something, when do you, you could comment on? Do you, have you achieved this in mid -nots? Uh Let me just read the question. Uh, sorry. Uh, um, there's, an, uh, there's a holistic assessment that's carried out in the community by Community Health Services, which is based on the um, comprehensive geriatric uh, assessment tool which is nationally recognized as best practice and it's just been made electronic so that it can be shared with uh, acute health colleagues so it will follow the patient into hospital and they they've got access to that at the front door of the hospital when the patient's admitted um, it's that's phase one phase two is to roll it out to the wards and have the ward staff amending that assessment it hasn't got to that point yet we as social care have been in discussion about that assessment because there's we have our own community support assessment that that um, leads to actual obviously personal budgets being allocated to people and there's an, uh, a number of fields that overlap between these two assessments, but then there's additional fields that we do separately. We, as social care, we're very wary about giving health staff um, a role in assessment that would then lead to the allocation of funding. So we're definitely not at that point yet, but we are extremely interested and in pursuing the idea of at least sharing assessment information. And we can't do that at the moment, but we've got some ideas about how, how to do it. Um, Anne's asked a question about in terms of home first, where do we see the where we see the service sitting in the acute or or the community? I mean, I don't think it matters where it sits as long it is as long it is actually a jointly organised and jointly planned planned service. There are examples where. Um, the people are discharged home, still under the care of the hospital, under the care of the, the um, geriatrician or the appropriate consultant, and then the case is, is, is managed intensively uh, through the acute hospital, 
that until I hand over to, um, to social care and community services. Uh, there are others where um, it is actually a joint care package from health and social care right from the start, and others where um, uh, social care are actually working more on behalf of both health and social care to actually keep people safe following um, a home um, a home first discharge and assessment. So I, I'm not. I'm not obsessed as to where it, it happens. Uh, what, I, what I'm not so keen on is uh, where um, an acute hospital just um, determines to do its own thing. Um, I think it's really important that it is actually jointly planned, jointly executed, jointly operationalized. And as we begin to move more towards accountable care organizations, I think this is something um, which we will probably get much, much better at. Again, I don't know whether you want to comment on that, Wendy. No, I, I, I agree with you. Um, it's definitely something that an integrated system needs to be working towards. And ideally, we need health staff to be as aware of the issues for social care as social care needs to be aware of, of health issues when we're undergoing assessments. Um, and we're thinking about holistic worker training to try and raise the level of skills so that that, that can happen across all, all fronts, really, in mid knots. Okay, um, we're coming to an end now, and Iris is going to uh, just do um, just a, a final message for everybody. But I think what's been fantastic is the way you've shared information as we've been talking. Uh, this is the first time I've done a webinar where we've actually I've not been able to listen to people, but I've actually tracked it through the computer. And I think the amount of sharing, the amount of, of good practice, which has already been evidenced, um, is fantastic. So thank you very much for joining myself and, and Wendy. And thank you, Wendy, for, for taking part. And I'm going to go back to Iris now. Hi. Thanks very much, everybody. Um, I've just shared. Uh, an email address with you as well. Uh, if you're not already registered for the Better Care eBulletin, um, you might want to register for that. Just contact the team at that email address. As I've mentioned, we will be recording and publishing the webinar uh, and, and all the links that w um, Wendy and Hannah both talked about, so you'll be able to get that on um, the Sky website and also through the Better Care Fund Bulletin and indeed through the Sky Bulletin. So thank you very much for taking part. Um, really great that people have shared information and those who have offered to share information, um, we'd be really interested in hearing from you directly as well um, so that we can share it on the Sky and the Better Care Fund websites too. So thank you very much. We're about to uh, be closed down in a moment. Uh, we have got other webinars coming up on issues such as data sharing, sharing risks and benefits and measuring success. So again, all of that information is available on the Sky website, so please do share with colleagues as well. Thank you very much and uh, all the best for the weekend. <laughs>